Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Rock Your Code Coding Standards for Microsoft.net. Um, I'm glad you're all here. Um, unfortunately, the I couldn't get the audio to hook up. I thought you could do that, but yeah. Oh, well. Anyway, welcome to uh, again to uh, my session about coding standards. I actually haven't done this uh, for a while now, so um, I'm really happy to uh, do this. It's been a number of years. You know, coding standards is, is something that, uh, you know, I've been uh, doing ever since I've been a software engineer. You know, I released my first book on coding standards uh, back in 2005, and I've been talking about it ever since. And so a lot of the information in this deck is almost all the information from this deck is is in my book. So I hope you pick up a copy. Uh, but uh, but most importantly, you know, the main takeaway I want to do for the session is to go back to your team uh, Monday and say, we need to do coding standards and we need a, a good coding standards because most of the teams I go to uh, either have no coding standards, which is the majority, and if they do, it's very little. It's like one or two pages, and that's not really coding standards, if you ask me. So that's why we I uh, write about this all the time, and that's why I'm doing this session. So a little bit about me. I'm David Ricardo. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I'm also a C-sharp corner MVP. Um, I'm, I'm an architect, consultant, and blah, blah, blah. There's all my handles and everything. I'm actually uh, on the hunt for a new uh, position right now. Uh, my last contract ended last Friday. And so if you need a code quality czar, which I am one, uh, uh, hit me up. Um, I'm looking uh, for the next uh, uh, team to work in. So, And please, please feel free to ask questions during my session. I'll try to ask them, uh, answer them as, as best I can. And also, uh, please, afterwards, feel free to reach out to me. I will always answer your questions if you contact me in any of those ways. And uh, like I mentioned, I have a coding standards book. It's in its seventh edition. And so I hope you go pick up a copy uh, right now. And um, because we all need something to start with, and that's the whole goal of this book is to get you started in your coding standards. And so I hope you pick up a copy. Um, to go along with that, I also have a new book out about code performance. The third edition of my code performance book is out right now. It came out in January. And that goes along with code uh, quality and coding standards because uh, performance is something that's super and su super important and especially important uh, these days with the cloud. So, all right, so here's what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, I'm gonna go kind of quick because I've got a lot to do and, and not enough time. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about why I'm doing this talk excuse me, go over some application setup things I see over and over again that people need to work on. And a little bit about coding standards uh, with some uh, real world uh, examples I'm gonna show you. Then I'm gonna talk about writing better code, which is something we all need to think about and then some odds and ends and then uh, the conference is over. So why are standards needed? You know, when I do this in, in uh, person, I asked everybody, uh, why do they think uh, coding standards are needed? So uh, if you want to put that in the chat, I'd love to hear from you. But um, first off, you might not agree with everything I say, and, and that's totally okay. You know, uh, all I the whole goal of this session is to get you talking about coding standards and implementing them at your company. So if you don't agree with me, that's okay. But I'm right. No, I'm kidding. Um, pick a standard for your company. The company needs to have a standard. Uh, uh, depending on the programming language, of course. So make sure the company has a standard. Um, this, you know, make sure that all the programmers are on the same page. This is super, super important, um, especially with uh, teams all over the world, like uh, the last contract I worked on. Easier to read and understand code. You know, uh, we never write code that's never looked at again. And so we need to pay attention to its readability and maintainability. Uh, because we're going to have to go back and modify it, fix bugs, add features uh, later down the road. So we have to be cognizant of this as we're writing the code, not six months or years later. Easier to maintain the code. You know, if code is easy to read and understand, it's, it's much, much simpler to uh, maintain. And I don't know how many times I stare at code going, what is going on? 
you know, and it, it shouldn't really be that way. Um, so also produces more stable and reliable code. If you, if you do coding standards and make sure they're being done, you're going to have more stable code. You know, I know many, many teams struggle with this, even my last uh, contract where, you know, stuff goes down all the time. And, you know, so, you know, we need to think about this and and be uh, really careful. And this is extremely important if you hire contractors, right? Contractors are there just for a temporary time. And, and a lot of contractors just don't really care about this stuff. So we need to make sure we're making them do it um, by uh, running code analysis tools during the build and things like that, and, uh, and and make sure they're doing the coding standards that your company wants. But first, you have to have coding standards. So I see spaghetti code all the time. You know, most of the contracts I've been on recently is just fixing, you know, basically their spaghetti code, and so. And because most code, uh, actually all projects I'm on need a lot of code quality work. And uh, so I want to share with you some real numbers uh, from a real in production solution. I'm not making, <laughs> I'm not making any of these numbers up. Uh, I wish, I, I wish they were fake numbers, but uh, they're not. So let's go over some of these numbers. So this code, but this solution has uh, over almost 4,000 errors if they use my editor config file. And I'll, I'll share that with you uh, later. So almost 4,000 errors in one solution. That's a, that's a lot. Uh, uh, 6,665 uh, warnings, which to me also have to be fixed along with errors. Errors and warnings should be zero. And uh, information, you can have, but errors and warnings need to be zero. I can't stress that enough. And so they have far too many, there are 10,000 of these uh, they need to work on. The entire solution has a cyclomatic complexity of seven, 70, almost 78,000. Here, let me write that down because that's gonna come back. I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Um, almost 78,000. Uh, that's its number, and I'll I'll talk to you why that's important uh, coming up, and and far too, way too much class coupling, and something else uh, we need to work on is making sure classes aren't tightly coupled together, and this solution has a lot of that uh, that needs to be worked on. Other issues I saw in this solution, almost no code dealing with uh, globalization localization. And this solution is supposed to work in different countries. And so <clears throat> they're, they're in a world of hurt uh, coming up because uh, globalizing your app 20, uh, 10, five, even a couple of years after it's been written is horribly expensive and takes a really long time. I've been through it too many times. Almost 10,000 lines of cloned code. You know, cloned code is a maintenance nightmare and needs to be zero. Uh, so. Uh, a lot of work there, and a lot, a lot of the work I did for this uh, project was fixing their threading, performance, and memory issues. And that was the main thing I did during uh, the time I was on this contract, because they were having lots of issues, including <clears throat> when I started with the contract, they could only handle like a hundred uh, concurrent users. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I left, we were up to seven thousand, but the business wants forty thousand. So. They still have some work to go. Sorry, I've been talking more than normal and uh, my mouth is dry. And tons of spelling issues, especially because, you know, we have uh, people from all over the world working on this project. So after selecting a, uh, a standard, make sure it's available to each programmer easily. Um, enforce via code reviews and pair programming. Just don't put coding standards out there because people aren't going to do it. Software engineers <laughs> will do whatever they want unless you make sure they're they're all adhering to the coding standards. So make sure they're enforced. Um, it must be included in the build process or use some of the other tools uh, that were talked about uh, during this conference. And don't release it to QA or even your, your dev machines until 
there's a certain a number of uh, uh, errors and warnings you're willing to accept. So uh, make sure it's, it has to be part of the bill process. Someone else said this earlier. I wish the sound was working because there's music going on right now that I'm hearing and you're not. Oh, dang it. Um, so to me, there's there's three kinds of pro programmers. There used to be two. When I first started doing this uh, talk, I, I I was doing some research and I found some uh, some somebody said there's two types of programmers, but I added a third one and uh, you'll see what that is. So the first one is complexifiers. They're adverse to re, uh, redu reduction or completing anything. Um, and I've worked with uh, complexifiers before and they're very, very hard to work with because they, they never seem to be done. They want to constantly work on the same code over and over again. And you can't release, <laughs> you can't release your code when you do that. Uh, and so some of that work needs to be done, but not constantly. And so complexifiers usually do it constantly. And um, I've actually left a contract once because I, I couldn't deal with a complexifier on the team. So um, we, we don't want complexifiers. The one the the uh, programmer that I made up was a prognate, uh, which is a word that I came up with, which means uh, will not listen to anyone and thinks they know everything. <laughs> I know people like that too. <clears throat> and And they're difficult to deal with and actually, you know, the, the people I've dealt with like that um, actually produce pretty much the worst code I've seen. And uh, so, uh, you know, we don't want prognance either. And so what we want is what I believe I am, and that's a simplifier, which our last guest just talked about. You know, I thrive on concision. You know, I seek the simplest way to achieve what needs to be done in, in the most, with the best quality and the best performance. And so that's what I do all the time. And I do try to make uh, my, my code look simple because I want anybody to be able to go back and modify it or add features and things like that, regardless of what level of software engineer they are. Um, so I try, I, I sometimes go out of my way to make sure that the code is really, really simple to understand by just about anybody on the team. So um, I hope you will strive to be a simplifier because uh, you know, that's that will produce the best code and the best outcomes. If the code is too complex, you know, if the method or class seems too big or overly complicated, it needs refactoring or rewriting. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, but I've seen too much of this where if the code is too complex, it's hard to unit test, it's even harder to refactor. And uh, we, you know, we don't want that. It, we need small classes, small methods, and simple to understand and use. And a long time ago, I know monitors are bigger now, but a long time ago at a conference, somebody came up to me and asked me, how, you know, how much code in the window is too much? And I said, if it goes off the end of your monitor, it's too much. And so I, I'm still kind of sticking with that, uh, but. Um, uh, but I use a larger font, so maybe that works for me because uh, I'm getting older. Refactor. So if, if the code is too complex, um, you need to refactor. Always, always, always code for reusability. I, I, I could say this a million times and it wouldn't be enough. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in later in the session. You want to strive for low cyclomatic complexity. Um, remember the, the code base I just talked about had a cyclomatic complexity of 77,801 and had 523 unit tests. So um, I use, when I'm in person, I go into a long talk about what cyclomatic complexity means to me. But I just released an article about that on C Sharp Corner. I hope you go check it out. But basically, the cyclomatic complexity number to me means uh, that's how many unit tests we need to properly test encapsulation. So you can see in this code base, they're <laughs> really lacking in unit tests and because they only have 523. And they really need close to 77,000. 
So, uh, you know, I had a lot, I, I explained this in the article, but I had a talk with the team before I left uh, that they need to, you know, work really hard on these unit tests because they're really lacking. I'll always code with generics in mind. I always try to make uh, uh, methods uh, more usable, reusable by using generics. So uh, keep that in mind also. And if, in, if something, you know, if you need help, ask somebody. If you need help with refactoring, make it simpler, anything like that, ask someone. I'm sure somebody on your team will be able to help out. And pair programming can also help too. So I've never done pair programming. It, it, I don't know if anybody out there has, uh, but uh, uh, that can that can also help too. And code review, code review, very very important. I very rarely am I on a team now where we do any code reviews except for pull requests. Um, so I always try to participate in those. So um, one time when I was doing the session, I wanted I asked people, you know, what can make code quality better? And so these are their answers. These are not mine. A unit test integration, I just talked about unit testing, um, very, very important. Training and team and team meetings, very, very important. I see very little training at companies. Uh, so uh, that's very, very important. So I yes, code review, just talked about that. Code analytics, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about in this, but if you read my article on c -Sharp Corner right now, um, I talk more about that. And developer culture of quality. This is what most teams need, and you know, and this is why I came up with a new title called "Code Quality Czar," is because teams need to develop a culture of quality. Um, otherwise, they're just going to end up with a pile of spaghetti code, like I see in almost every single uh, solution I work on. So, we need to develop a, a culture of quality. Um, we need to care about our craft. Um, you know, um, I, you know, some people care more about coding than others, and uh, uh, but to, to produce good, stable code, uh, we really need to care about what we do and, and care about quality. Uh, keep learning, evolving. Uh, very, very true. You know, uh, you know, our world changes every day, and uh, we have to constantly learn and evolve. And uh, uh, no one's perfect. Believe me, not even me. No one's perfect. Uh, so, and teach students standards and architecture, which is something that I do. And when I taught at the university, or whenever you know I'm in front of students or anybody, is I try to teach them standards and architecture. And I'll, I'm going to be talking a little bit about architecture today. And coding standards uh, equals uh, secure, robust, and maintainable code. Yes, totally agree. Okay. Next section, uh, I want to go over a couple things. This is in detailed in my uh, uh, coding standards book. In, in detail, I just want to go over a couple things I see uh, companies uh, lacking when I, I join their team, and that is uh, naming your project. Make sure you pick a proper name uh, for your project, um, especially because um, that's going to be uh, usually uh, the name of your DLL or EXE, but also the name of your uh, uh, base namespace too. Um, so this is a guideline that I say, like I say, there's more detail in my book where it starts with company and then component, and then you can keep going like that. So here's some examples. Uh, two are from uh, libraries that I've built. You can see the .NET tips .app .ads .data access, and then uh, .NET tips .spargen .core. And that's the way I name things. I put .NET tips in front of it if it's, uh, you know, if if that's what it's under. You can see the way DevExpress and then Microsoft does theirs too. So uh, please try to name yours the same. Uh, I will thank you when I join your team, that's for sure. Um, NuGet package information. So a lot of the, uh, the information that we used to put in another tab in Visual Studio, like uh, the name of the project and uh, and things like that are actually in uh, the NuGet package information now. So uh, make sure you go there. Even if you're not making a NuGet package, you can uncheck that uh, check mark at the top there. But uh, make sure your package ID, package version is set up. Uh, you can do the default, which um, that shows right there. Or you can type in whatever you want for the package ID. Um, 
And these two uh, screens are vitally important for a lot of reasons. And that is, you know, make sure you have the authors listed, the company product description, copyright, project URL, and all those other things, because um, they come into play if you're like uh, displaying the version number. Well, that comes up in a second. But if you publish this on NuGet, um, this information is seen. There's a lot of reasons why this information is important. So make sure all of your projects and your solution, you know, have all of this information filled out. Uh, the, the last uh, project I was on, none of this was really filled out. So make sure this is filled out. Um, also pick a, a, a default language because this comes into play with globalization, which I'll talk a little bit about today, and assembly version and file version. Uh, the way I do these numbers, um, that's kind of the, the way I name things right there. I mean, number things. But I make sure that you know when I do a, a, a an official release that um, that the project all has the same version numbers and 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 go from there. And so make sure you keep those up to date. Unfortunately, um, Visual Studio still pretty much sucks at at keeping these up to date automatically for you. So uh, unfortunately, this is a manual process. I just do search and replace. <laughs> That's the way I do it. Um, the big thing on this screen I want to show is treat warnings as errors. I can't stress this enough because to me, warnings are yellow lights. And yellow lights mean something's bad about to happen. Stop. <laughs> so uh, make sure you go to your projects Monday and turn that on. Uh, you're going to have a lot of errors, I guarantee it. But And so just fix them. But if you do that, uh, your code will be so much more stable if you do that, because then you'll have to treat all the warnings just, and you'll have to fix the warnings before it'll compile. So uh, I really, really uh, hope you'll do that. So um, on the code analysis uh, screen for your project setup, make sure you have a, a run on build and run on live analysis, or at least run on build setup. Um, because because every time you do that, um, after the build, it'll analyze your code and then tell you what's wrong. And you need to fix it right away, not later, not six months later, not five years later. You need to fix it right away uh, because it'll become a problem. Um, and also uh, make sure you pick the correct analysis level. Uh, what I my general rule is for DLLs, I pick uh, latest recommended for EXEs, including ASP.NET websites. I pick uh, all, or I, I forget what it's called off the top of my head, because that checks everything, which you need, because that involves some extra security things. Yeah, violations will appear when fix ASAP. And, um, and you need to implement the editor config file. This is how code is, is analyzed in Visual Studio now. It's completely changed from what it used to be. So, and it's all run off editor config. And the other thing about editor config is uh, applications like uh, refactoring tools like Code Rush, which is what I use, actually respect the editor config and show you and do things based on that. Um, so it's very important you have a robust editor config for your solution. Um, this is mine. You can go download it there. It's a very strict <laughs> editor config uh, because I turn a lot of things, errors of the things I see people do over and over again um, as I analyze millions and millions of lines of code. And so um, I, may, I update it every quarter, if not um, more often. So go back and check it often. Uh, but you can go download it, download it there, and it's the biggest editor config file I've ever seen. It's so I think it's close to two thousand lines, which is much bigger than Visual Studio puts out. I've spent many, 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 many hours trying to figure out all the settings for the code analysis, which, like I said, Visual Studio doesn't do. Um, so I hope you go check it out and implement it. And and all the analysis I'm showing in this talk is based off of that editor config. Um, always use resources for strings and images. This is super important for globalization and localization. Basically, anything a user sees needs to be in a resource. Uh, images, text, you know, um, audio, 
uh, while that's listening, right? Anything like that needs to be in resources because if you do that, it's much simpler to, to uh, you know, translate those into different languages. So make sure all of those items are in resources, including images, because I don't think a lot of people out there realize, but, you know, images, you know, we might use in an application in America might be offensive in other countries. And so we have to change those. All right. So I've got a couple uh, uh, coding standards issues, uh, and these are issues I see all the time, and that's why they're they're featured in this section. Um, and I, in all my talks and my writings, and pretty much every single example I'm going to show you is real. I don't make this up. Um, I do change a little bit so I don't get in trouble, but um, all of these samples are completely real. So. Um, Unfortunately, I still see people not doing type conversions correctly, um, even now. <laughs> and um, and here's a great example of just one of those issues I see um, pretty often, and that is uh, converting a string uh, to a date time, which is done very very, uh, which is done a lot, right? But the problem with using convert to date time like this is if that date time isn't properly formatted, which of course we know users are gonna screw it up, it's gonna cause a format exception. And we don't wanna cause exceptions because they dramatically impact the performance of your application. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of work that I do and that you need to do to make sure that you're not introducing exceptions. And that's exactly what this is doing. Uh, so we don't wanna do this. And this is actually, this is actually some from real code where they were using this code to test if that was a proper date time string, which is just all kinds of bad. So the way you should do it is use try parse. So here's an example. Um, instead of the previous way you do date time dot try parse, that returns a Boolean whether it was a, uh, was if it was successfully you know, uh, converted from a string to a date time. So you need to use try parse. It does not cause an exception at all. And so uh, please make sure if you, if you use any type and it had something like try something, use that because it's gonna be a much safer way of doing things with that type. Exception issues. Uh, this is uh, one of the most horrible exception uh, a trapping code I've ever seen. Um, and so I'll just go over the issues. Um, so first off, uh, they're catching data exceptions. as you can see there. I don't know how to turn on the laser pointer with this uh, uh, window uh, PowerPoint, uh, but you can see they're catching data exception, then they're turning around and, and throwing a new data exception. No, 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 <laughs> don't do that. I'll show you the right way. Um, then they're throwing EX, bad. Again, I'll show you the right way in a second. Um, and then they're, they're basically in this, if that data exception was called, um, then it will actually be caught in the lower exception. And then they're throwing an improper exception. So uh, this has lots of things uh, going wrong with it. Um, always add caught exceptions as the inner exception. Um, this prevents losing the stack trace. You can't lose the stack trace because if you do, you've basically lost how the how the code got to that point. And uh, you know, debugging and trying to figure that out is going to be near impossible if you don't do that. So in this case, you know, if they were going to throw a new data exception, in this case, then they need to make sure that the original exception is part of this exception. I would argue that you wouldn't throw a data exception uh, from a data exception, but if you had to, make sure you include the original one because that's got all the stack trace in it. Uh, Rethrowing exceptions, uh, yeah. So I still see code like this, and I might, I'm not sure why, because <laughs> .NET's been out for uh, 21 years now. Uh, throw ex. I'm not sure why this is allowable in .NET to tell you the truth. Uh, don't do throw EX. It's not the proper way of throwing exceptions. The only proper way of re-throwing an exception is throw. 
don't use the exception, okay? If you're going to re-throw an exception, use throw, not the first way. I wish they would have ripped that out and done that uh, core. Also, um, uh, don't, uh, uh, yeah, don't throw these exceptions. Don't throw the exception type. Don't throw the application exception and don't throw system exception. Um, they're, they're, oh, the last two are internal Microsoft exceptions. You should not be using those. Microsoft uses those. Um, the first one we should only be using to inherit to make our own exceptions. You should never be raising the exception type because it's not detailed enough. No one really knows what it means. It's just generic and it's, it's, it's not the right way to do it. If, if there's not an exception type uh, that meets your needs, then make one. It, they're not that hard to create. So ask ChatGPT to make you one. <laughs> so um, so here you, I, I show you an example of, uh, uh, you know, create a customer exception and, and throw a custom exception. And um, I also have a, a video out there uh, about this too. So I, I hope you go check it out. Class design. So um, I asked people, is this good class design? And the answer is absolutely not. Uh, what's happening here is they're calling basically the code, all the, the one method in this, in this uh, project uh, called process order. You don't do that from the constructor ever. You don't call code from a constructor ever. Um, and I'll go over that in a second. And that's what they were doing. And, um, and, 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 and in this case, if an exception happened in the constructor, your application will basically die. It will just disappear. I've seen it happen. And uh, so we don't want to do that. Uh, don't do that. Um, the proper way to do it, do constructors at least, is in constructors, you should only be setting properties and fields. That's it. No calling code. If uh, if something needs to be processed and create a method like process order to do the processing, but not in the constructor, okay? Because like I said, you, you don't want to cause exceptions from the constructor. So the only thing you should be doing is setting variables, uh, uh, properties, or fields, okay? All right, so that's the end of that section. Now we're going to um, go into writing better types. I kind of wanted to spend a little bit more time on this, and I'm trying to keep it time because I know we have uh, time issues with StreamYard. So here's my top three rules. Um, assemblies must be dumb and stupid. I'll go over that. They must implement data, log uh, implement data and logic encapsulation and they must be reusable, okay? If you follow those three rules, you're gonna create uh, great assemblies. And uh, and one of my pet peeves, which I see in every project I work on, is all the not enough data validation. And the last project I, I was on had almost none. And all data must be uh, validated coming into the type. Otherwise, you're breaking encapsulation and you're breaking object-oriented programming, okay? So, so it, I ask people, is this a dumb and, and stupid constructor? And it's not. Why? Because they're using, if you can see there, the config.log path is, is somewhere else in the, you know, in the project, and you don't do that. And you also don't do this either. Both those config things should not be in the constructor, okay? So this is not a dumb and stupid constructor. So uh, is this a dumb and uh, a stupid method in DLLs? It's not because they're catching exceptions. So one of my rules with um, DLLs assemblies is you should never be catching exception ever in the DLL. You should let that bubble up to the calling code. Um, the only exceptions you should be handling in reusable DLLs are exceptions you can do something with, like close database connections or clean up a file handle or something like that. Otherwise, let it bubble up, and I'll talk about that in a second. So yeah, th that's not the right way to do it. 
Any knowledge the class needs must be provided like database connection strings, file names, any other values, or and you can also use dependency injection. But any knowledge the class needs to operate correctly needs to be sent into it. The class should not have to reach out and get that information. It should be sent in, okay? Um, API DLLs should never log or email exceptions. I still see people do this unless they're using dependency injection, but I would even argue DLLs should never do it. Um, that should be the job of the application. So um, here's how I would fix that. You can see here in a constructor, I'm, setting, I'm, I'm sending in these two connection strings. That's the proper way of doing it. And then you can see down here, I'm, I'm catching SQL exception and I'm doing something with it. That's the proper way of, uh, of, of doing that, okay? So I'm going kind of quick because uh, we're running short on time. You know, implementing data and logic encapsulation prevents uh, the setting of internal data to invalid inconsistent state. We don't want that. Benefits are reduce complex, complexity, limit interdependencies, reuse, and lots of other things. Uh, so we need to think about, you know, if you don't think about inheritance and polymorphism, fine, but you need to worry about encapsulation because I really see uh, it not done well enough in, in any project I'm on. Um, so you should group uh, related properties methods uh, to create a single type with a single purpose, right? A type should only be doing one thing. If you need something else, write a different type, right? We need to keep types small. Type, you know, classes should not be 20,000, 10,000, 5,000 lines of code. It should be, they should be a lot smaller. Any interaction with the data within the type must be done through methods and properties only, okay? Uh, what I mean is no fields. Fields should never, ever, ever, under any circumstance, be public, okay? And data validation is key. Um, all the data coming in your type needs to be validated, all of it. Otherwise, um, you're going to cause, you're going to in introduce exceptions, and if that, bad data gets into the database, it's even harder to fix. And so we need to stop it before it even gets to the database. So um, in this example, I'm actually encapsulating the way you create an order collection, which is something I don't see done enough. And that is, you know, you need to write this type of logic into your types and not let other people do it because they'll do it five or 10 different ways, right? So here I have a, 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 a type called order collection. And you can see here, the order collection has a public static uh, create, right? So the only way to create an order collection is to send in orders and then the type does the work. And uh, you can see here, I make sure that the collection's not read only. And then I do a for each. And uh, if it's not null, um, then I add it uh, to the collection, and at the end, I return the orders, right? So you should be writing code like this, right? If someone needs to create a, a collection of something, that should be encapsulated within that collection type, okay? And here's some more. Here's how you add an order. Um, and here I'm doing some uh, 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 checking, which all these you know, these uh, condition checkings are all from my Spartan open source project. And then I add the order. And and, and the other thing I wanted to bring up, because I see this over and over again at, at, at uh, uh, projects, is that, you know, um, a developer shouldn't have to know what makes an open order, right? That should be encapsulated within the type. Because, you know, depending on what that means, you know, there could be lots of flags you have to look at and things like that in the database. Developers, we don't have time to do that, right? That, that should have been encapsulated within the type by whoever originally architected it, right? So uh, make sure you do uh, code like that too. Reuse and reuse and more reuse. Always code for reuse. 90% of your code should be in reusable DLLs. Uh, if you do that, um, everything will be much better to a unit test 
and run and modify and change, use generics wherever possible, use design patterns. We had a whole talk on design patterns today. Uh, so use those where appropriate. Use existing frameworks. We've already talked about that in the conference today. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel unless it needs to be invented. Uh, research um, existing frameworks. There's tons of them out there. If you have an idea for something, it's probably someone else did who's written a library for it. So uh, go research that. Um, I don't have time to, uh, well, let me go over this real quick because uh, Joe did kind of talk about this, but this is basically how I, d by default, architect applications. I always have a data layer, um, which has a data access DLL. In this case, it was Cosmos DB. And then I have a entities DLL, and then I have a functions DLL for microservices. You can see how I'm separating things out. I have a cloud access for communications and also uh, an API an ads API for an app service. On top of that, I have an admin DLL, which is the Blazor app. And then on top of that, I have a, I have a Windows app uh, connecting to all this too. And uh, that's my old um, app. I have a newer one out you can go check out right now. Um, and this is how I reuse DLLs within the app, at, that Windows app itself. And you can see here, I have all these different DLLs separated out, and there's very little code in the application itself. You can see I have it all separated out into separate um, DLLs, uh, not only for testing and things like that, but also for reuse, right? Because whenever I code, I think that code is going to be reused someday. Um, that's just the way I do it. And um, here's some other ones. And then I'm also using my own open source libraries too. So I want to go over that real quick. Okay, odds and ends, just go a few more things. Uh, this is one thing that I'm going to thank you for if you do this, and and that is, in, especially with collections, is that if, if you have a collection and you look at it with, uh, if you stop and look at it with a debugger, uh, that's what it looks like. If you look at the items in collection, you can just see person, 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 which is really not very helpful. So there is a way to fix this, and that's by using the debugger display. And so if I change it to say, I want the email at, to show up instead of the previous uh, uh, object name, then I can do that. And, and, and you can see that's so much more usable by the developers. So the developer is going to thank you if you start doing uh, that. Um, always, always code for globalization. Um, I, I, I'm coming up with a new globalization workshop I can do at conferences. Uh, because this is a big issue I see in every single project I'm on. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. I already talked about resource files. You need to also worry about formatting dates and integers and things like that. Um, make sure to unit test. You should strive for 75% code coverage, if not more, but at least 75%. You can see you know, by the numbers I showed you today, that project that I showed you at the beginning of the, the session, uh, they're far, far, far from 75% code coverage. And also perform performance and diagnostics testing, which is something I don't see enough. And I'm not talking about, yes, performance of your API endpoints is important, but the performance of the code is important too. And that needs to be worked on. And, and one of our uh, speakers talked about uh, benchmark.net, which I use. Other things to keep in mind, uh, keep up technology like i said you know our world changes every day um if you have too much to do reduce the vol velocity um because we want to produce good stable clean quality code and so if you're not doing it reduce your velocity and of course i've talked about this already readability is super important um because um uh we all need that uh so uh i don't i'm gonna go over that so here's my minimum workflow before I check in code. Uh, first, I always use uh, standards and refactoring while I'm coding. And then the next thing I do is I, I document the code with a ghost doc and I make code comments as much as I can. Uh, then I check the code using uh, Visual Studio Analyze and, uh, and sometimes Endepend. I don't do Endepend all the time, but towards the end of the project I do. And then run unit tests. 
and then commit the code. So if you follow this workflow, that this is the workflow I use, where I check in really good code that hardly I hardly get QA talking to me about ever, and because I follow this workflow, and I hope you will too. All right, a couple more slides because we're at time. Code quality is a feature, not an afterthought. Management doesn't care about code quality, so you have to. Okay, so um, everybody above you really doesn't care about this stuff because it, it's not a feature and it doesn't make money. So, but you need to be uh, uh, cognizant of it. And there's lots of ways of learning code quality, books, community events, online training, websites, tools, um, lots of ways of doing it. I write about this, of course, all the time. I'm gonna go over that too. All right, so we're at time already. So I hope you go check out my website, .netsips.com. Um, I have an article out there called Reuse, Reuse, and More Code Reuse. I hope you could check out. You know, there's a couple uh, courses on Pluralsight that I, I definitely recommend. Um, Clean Code uh, with Corey House and C-Sharp Best Practices with Deborah Carrada. Uh, there's a great video from one of my friends. I hope you go check out. If you want to check out my open source library, um, it's there. And then, of course, I hope you check out uh, Rockin' a Code with Donna Dave by going there. And with that, um, thanks for everybody for uh, uh, watching my session. <laughs>